spoke a word, you sing over me. You have been so, so good to me. For I took a breath, and you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind. Nine. 
I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come And knowing the battles won still stands great is your faithfulness your faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you've never failed me yet The night won't last For your word will come to pass And my heart will sing your praise again Oh Jesus, you're still enough So keep me within your Sing your praise again. Oh, yes, it will. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail.
This is my confidence You never fail Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Your faithfulness I'm still in your hands This is my confidence You never fail me Welcome back to Nag State Church. If you're here for the first time, we're so glad that you uh, chose to join us uh, for our worship uh, service today. I want to start out with a question. Uh, what would happen if a revival of biblical Christianity broke out in America? I meet personally, I meet with every Wednesday morning on Zoom with a group of local pastors for prayer. And our prayer focus is revival. And by revival, I don't mean a series of services where a church invites a special speaker or evangelist who has five suits and five sermons. You know what I mean? Revival is a supernatural movement of God upon his people who have strayed, and it results in a return to righteous living. And my belief personally is that we as a nation are desperate for a return to God. Uh, revivals are few in this world. I've witnessed two in my lifetime, both nearly 50 years ago, one that swept across, across the nation and a second one that swept across a church and a college. The last two kings in our summer series, if you've been with us, are kings who led revivals. And I'm so excited we get to uh, learn today about Hezekiah. He was a great king. Uh, as I read his story several times, and there is more written about Hezekiah than any of the other kings other than Solomon. As I read his story, I could see some great applications for us today in the church. So I'm going to start with these uh, words. If you have your Bible, you can turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 29. And uh, I'm going to start there, and I hope you'll join me there. And I'm going to read the first 11 verses. So follow along with me. Hezekiah was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the Lord's sight, just as his ancestor David had done. In the first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened the doors of the, of the Lord's temple and repaired them. And then he brought in the priests and Levites and gathered them in the eastern public square. And he said to them, Hear me, Levites! Consecrate yourselves now and consecrate the temple of the Lord, the God of your ancestors. Remove everything impure from the holy place. For our fathers were unfaithful and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord our God. They abandoned him, turned their faces away from the Lord's tabernacle, turned their backs on him. They also closed the doors of the portico, extinguished the lamps, and did not burn incense and did not offer burnt offerings in the holy place of the God of Israel. Therefore, the wrath of the Lord was on Judah and Jerusalem, and he made them an object of terror, horror, and mockery, as you see with your own eyes. Our fathers fell by the sword, and our sons, our daughters, and our wives are in captivity because of this. It's in my heart now to make a covenant with the Lord, the God of Israel, so that his burning anger may turn away from us. My sons, don't be negligent now, for the Lord has chosen you to stand in his presence, to serve him, and to be his ministers and burners of incense. Hezekiah was 25 when he became king, and it says he reigned in Jerusalem for 29 years. That's a pretty good time. Uh, the first point I want us to see this morning in, in our notes is this. It only takes one to spark a revival. 
In Judah's case, the one was the king. It was Hezekiah. And that's a great person to take that step. But in other revivals in more recent history, it's been maybe a businessman uh, praying, inviting others to pray with him, or a schoolgirl who surrenders to the Lord, or it was the, the town party girl turning to Christ that was the beginning of the first great awakening in this country in the 1700s. Or it was more recently a pastor who refused to forbid barefoot hippie kids from church that sparked the Jesus movement in Southern California. Hezekiah knew that Judah's past idolatry and closing up the temple only stirred up God's anger against them. Attacking nations, especially the Assyrians, only made Israel a mockery. And it was at God's direction. So wisely, this young king, just 25, says, we're turning back to God. And Hezekiah, it says, made a covenant, made a promise to God. He was going to do, lead the nation to do just that. Revival brings a renewed sense of holiness to the community. He organized the Levites. They were the tribe commissioned by God to care for the temple. But they've been unemployed essentially for a couple of years, and now they're going to go and they're going to clean up the temple and repair God's house. They removed the pagan things in the temple that didn't belong there, and they took them outside the city. It took them 16 days, we're told, to get that done. But everything now in the temple, after those 16 days of cleaning house, it was all set to again worship God as God had prescribed in their law. Well, the next day, Hezekiah got all the city officials together to worship, gathered the priests. They sacrificed animals that the king himself provided, sprinkled the blood on the altar to atone for the sins of the whole nation while the king and the people watched. Hezekiah then formed a worship band of Levites and priests. And they had, not only did they have a band, but they, they had cymbals and they had harps and they had lyres and trumpets that says like David had done before. And then he ordered them, these priests, to offer the burnt offering on the altar with its smoke rising up to God in heaven. And as that happened, we're told the band began to play and the people began to sing until the sacrifice was burned up. One of the things that teaches us about revival is that revival restores worship where it's been lost. Then the king, after they did that, the king and the officials bowed down and they worshiped. A choir of Levites. He said, not only are you going to have a band, you Levites, but I want you to form a choir. And so the choir of Levites began to sing David's and Asaph's songs of praise that we have in the Psalms. And the people saw it and they heard it. And this was so different from what they had experienced. And it brought great joy to everyone. They rejoiced. They thought, man, we are worshiping the Lord again in his temple. And they realized that they had missed it. They realized we haven't done this in so long. So it brought a renewed excitement to them. I'm like, like most of you, I miss being with the church in person on Sunday mornings. I miss the shaking hands and the hugging. I miss hearing one another sing. You know, and that's because God's created us for community. But don't think for a moment that we're not able to worship even though we can't see one another. There are easily a thousand, right now, a thousand or more of us watching this online sermon this morning, and more are going to join us later. Sometimes we do what we have to do using our abilities and our creativity to make it happen. But God willing, the day when the day comes when Nags Head Church, when we do come back together on Sundays, I hope and pray it will resemble what happened here in Jerusalem. Then Hezekiah said to all the people, he called, they're called the congregation. He said, now you are consecrated to the Lord. Come near and bring your sacrifices and thank offerings to the Lord's temple. And they did so. And it says they did so with willing hearts. Again, it's been two years since they gave back to God. And the priests and the Levites depended on those sacrifices the people brought for their own food and income. Since they had no other jobs, they had no property to farm. There were 70 bulls, 100 rams, 200 lambs that came in. There's all this livestock and all these these sacrifices. And then they gave 600 bulls and 3,000 sheep. And there were so many animals sacrificed that there weren't enough priests to keep up. So they got the Levites to help out. But it didn't stop there. 
they had not celebrated Passover. And in the calendar, they were a month past when they should have celebrated Passover. So Hezekiah says, here's what we're going to do. Now, rather than wait for Passover to come around next year, we're going to celebrate it now. We're going to do Passover now. And so they let the rest of the nation know that Passover was about to be celebrated so the people would come from the rest of the country. They hadn't been celebrating Passover. Hezekiah sent letters throughout the kingdom inviting everyone to come. And he said, the Bible says this, he wrote the letter and he said, don't become obstinate now like your fathers did. Give your allegiance to the Lord and come to his sanctuary that has been consecrated forever. Serve the Lord your God so that he may turn his burning anger away from you. For when you return to the Lord, that's revival, your brothers and your sons will receive mercy in the presence of their captors and will return to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful. He will not turn his face away from you if you return to him. Chapter 30, verses 8 and 9. Well, many in Judah had not been in Jerusalem earlier when they clean, cleaned out the temple and reestablished the temple worship and consecrated everyone with the sacrifices. So Hezekiah is inviting everybody to come, tells us about revival at this point. Revival is inclusive. He said, may the Lord, good Lord, provide atonement on behalf of whoever seeks his whole heart, sets his whole heart on seeking God the Lord, the God of his ancestors, even though not according to the purification rules of the sanctuary, chapter 30, verses 18 and 19. It, it, essentially, it was this Passover. He said, it's a come as you are grace. So when they arrived, when they showed up and they got there, the Levites got busy sacrificing Passover lambs for every one of them. They weren't really supposed to eat the Passover meal, these people who had not been consecrated. But Hezekiah showed them grace. The Feast of Unleavened Bread would begin right after the Passover was over and was supposed to last seven days. It was a weekly feast. But you know what? Everybody wanted to stay. Nobody wanted to go home. They wanted to stay and celebrate. So the band played loud, their loud instruments and the people worshiped beyond the feast and extended it, the Bible tells us, seven more days. Well, here's another point about revival. It takes us out of the routine and the ordinary. Scripture tells us there was rejoicing in Jerusalem, for nothing like this was known since the days of Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel. And then the priests and the Levites stood to bless the people, and God heard their voice, and their prayer came up to his holy dwelling in heaven. You see, they weren't going through any motions here. What was happening? was a reigniting of spirit that had been missing for generations since Solomon's time when the temple was built. They had many times strayed into idolatry as a people, worshiping other gods. The priesthood and the Levites failed to fulfill their ministries. But now King Hezekiah brought them back to true worship of God. And God, as it says, heard their voice in their prayer in heaven. Let me ask you a question. Do you sing worship songs without letting the meaning soak into your soul? You know, I do that sometimes. I'll, I'll admit, I confess. I get to thinking about other things, and even though my lips are moving and sound is coming from my mouth, it isn't coming from my heart. So it really isn't then an act of worship. And the same thing can be true about prayer. It's one of those reasons why Jesus cautioned his disciples in Matthew chapter uh, six, I believe it is, not to pray like the idolaters, whose prayers, he said, were just vain babblings, words that come from the mouth, but not from the heart. See, in a true revival of worship, the singing and the praying sound different than before. What Hezekiah did here, another point here about revival that we're taught in this passage, is that revival reaches out to those on the outside. There is an evangelistic element to revival. Hezekiah's next step was to go throughout Judah, his country, and destroy the, the idols to Baal and Asherah. And he even went to the tribes of Manasseh and Ephraim in Israel, but they're on the outskirts where they had mocked him for worshiping the Lord. And he destroyed their idols as well. He's their king. Every single one of them, it says. 
And when, he, and when he then graciously extended the invitation to those in neighboring Israel, not his country, but their brothers up in Israel, he said, come on down and join us. The Bible tells us that some of those people laughed and mocked him. They were Israelites, supposed to be the people of God, but they had been away from God for so long that they saw no, saw no need to return to him. They didn't have the temple. It's down in Judah. It's in Jerusalem. And they had, during this time, suffered under idolatrous kings. We've read about and talked about several of them for the last four weeks, for generations. And now the Assyrians from the north have come down and taken so many of them away captive. They lost track of who they were. Well, when that was done, he extended this invitation. Hezekiah then reestablished the system of offerings to provide for the continued temple service of the priests and Levites. Let's not let this stop. It was time to put them back to work in leading the nation in worship. Now, the king set the pace. He started it off by bringing his own offerings in the morning and in the evening and for special occasions. And I see another principle here that applies to the church as it did to the nation of Judah, and that's this. Revived people will follow godly leaders. You see, he didn't come to them with a do as I say, but not as I do mandate. He led the way. And they gave, the people did as he had done. They gave as well in worship. He set the example of what it means for leadership to practice what we preach. Verse 5 tells us the result of Hezekiah's leadership there. It tells us the, the end result of what took place. And that's crucial for the church, the people of God. It's why in 1 Timothy chapter 3, there are very high standards given for the leaders of the church. And it's not that those of us in church leadership have a separate set of standards from everybody else. That's not the point. It's that we are, as leaders, to show by our lives, by our character, by our conduct, what it means to devote yourself so all of us in the church can know. What does it mean to devote yourself to the Lord in every area of your life? And so the church ought to be able to look at its leaders and know that the leaders are not asking us to do something they're not willing to do themselves, and they're not doing themselves. This national return to giving their tithes and giving their offerings restored the priesthood and enabled the Levites who took care of the temple. Now they can go back to their ministries because their needs were being met. The chief priest said, hey, since they began bringing the offering to the Lord's temple, he was kind of amazed. He said, we eat and are satisfied and there is plenty left over. Listen, because the Lord has blessed his people. Verse 10, he said, the abundance is what's left over. And there's a principle, another one that we need to catch. And that is this. Revival spurs generosity that brings about abundant blessings to God's people. When you and I give to God through the church, we are worshiping him. Because their giving, think about it now, their giving was a legal requirement for them. It's mandated by their law. And because of that, it became easy for them to see that it's just a tax, it's a pain in the wallet. It, it, more than it being a way to bless the Lord and ultimately the nation. But as Christians, our giving ought to be a joy. The Apostle Paul wrote that God loves a cheerful giver. It's not to be some uh, a legalistic obligation. And when giving becomes a joy, we can see the spiritual outcomes of it. So let me ask you a question before I close out this morning. How do you give? Do you give generously or do you give meagerly? Do you give with joy or do you give with grumbling? Well, God, I could do a whole lot more other things with that money. Part of their nation's revival resulted in an abundance of giving. Great lessons from revival from Hezekiah's story. What a great king, what a great leader. But as I read this and I think about the question that I asked at the beginning this morning about revival in the United States, I believe with all my heart that America is right now both in desperate need of a spiritual awakening, an awakening in many ways, but spiritually we've lost our way. 
because we've allowed the idols of secularism, the idols of politics and politicians to replace biblical Christianity. It's been going on for decades now. And I fear as a pastor who's been around the block more than a couple times, I fear that if there is not a revival within the church that the America, our, our founding fathers envisioned and intended, I fear that America will be lost forever. And I also believe, however, that revival is possible. I believe that God isn't asleep at the wheel. I believe God's just looking for that one who will dare to turn totally over his life, her life, totally over to him. And please let me help you grasp what I'm saying so that you don't misunderstand, because it is a political year. That's not going to happen on Capitol Hill. Probably not going to happen in the White House. It starts where? In the church with you and me. So will you pray? Will you allow God to enter the rooms of your life that you've held back from him? Will you personally clean out what doesn't belong in his temple, which is your body? Will you seek him with all your heart? Because if you do, revival could start today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that um, after so many evil kings uh, who let their nation go crazy with idolatry and they forgot the temple, they no longer worship there, they even brought idolatrous things into the temple, that here comes Hezekiah, this young 25-year-old man. And he says, it stops right here. We're going to return to God as a nation. And he led the return himself. He didn't delegate it to other people. He said, I'm going to start it. And he opened the temple doors and he provided the sacrifices. And he gave the mandates to the Levites and the priests to clean out the temple and rid it of all the things that didn't belong. So that once again, they could begin to worship and revival broke out across the nation. And the people rejoiced and the abundance came in and they reached out to their neighbors and all these things that happen as a result of revival. I thank you, God, for that. I thank you that, that, that this nation, the United States of America, that has been so long without a spiritual compass, it seems, this nation can return to you, but it's got to come through the church. Our nation is not the people of God. The church is the people of God. So, Lord, it's up to us. It's up to me. It's up to every person listening to my voice this morning. It's up to all of us who believe the Bible is the Word of God and Jesus Christ as the one and only Savior. So may we, God, not only pray for revival, but may we ask you to look into our hearts and clean up whatever doesn't belong there and ask you and give you permission to rearrange in our lives what needs rearranging to remove the things that don't belong in our priorities and our loves and return back to you as a people. May it start today with one. I'd like to be that one, God, but I'm not going to be jealous about that if it's another. Whoever it might be, it could be a leader. It could be somebody we've never heard of. It could be a teenage girl who starts a prayer meeting. But whoever it might be, God, may that revival Life we, we have experienced in times past in our country may once again sweep over our nation because we desperately need a return to you. May we learn these lessons today from Hezekiah and his story. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks for being with us today and uh, for joining us. If you'll stay for just a moment later, uh, we're going to say goodbye, but I hope to have you back next week. If we can do anything for you, let us know. Send us a note. Send us an email. Make a comment. Somehow let us know, and we'll reach out to you in whatever way that we possibly can. God bless you, and have a great week. Thanks for joining us today. If you have made a decision or want to communicate with us, click the link below. If you want to worship through giving, text NAGSED at 77977. If you have kids, make sure you check out our kids' videos at nagsheadchurch.org. Have a great day.